Thank you for all that. Let's move on to your new book, Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will, which is, uh, as I looked this morning, is available for pre-order on Amazon and elsewhere. Can you give an overview of the main thesis and and maybe um, in there, please start by defining what you mean by free will? Okay. Um, I published this book about five years ago called behave, uh, the biology of humans at their best and worst. And it was like the original draft was a thousand pages and my publisher had a panic attack and it was eventually merely a impossible 700 page. It was, how do you understand where social behavior comes from? Yeah, it was caused by neurons one second ago, but it was also caused by whatever environmental stimuli in the previous minute made those neurons do that. And it was also caused by your hormone levels this morning that made this or that part of the brain more or less sensitive to these uh, stimuli. And it has to do with like trauma or stimulation in the last year. And it's got to do with adolescence and, and fetal life and your genes interacting with all of that. And what's most like charming to me, it also has something to do with what kind of culture your ancestors invented 400 years ago, because that's going to have affected how your mother was mothering you within minutes of birth, cultural differences with that and thereafter. So everything from like, was there a good or bad smell in the room just now affects people's opinions about social politics to were your ancestors dealing with a high infectious disease load and thus they were spooked by foreigners coming in and that influences cultural differences and xenophobia today all of that stuff matters so you know i'd stand up in front of like a bunch of people and go on about this for 60 minutes and at the end the ones who were like still standing inevitably someone would say whoa you know this seems to kind of challenge the notion of free will and like my immediate response was uh yeah you think you know i haven't believed in free will since i was 13 or so but it was a little bit of a revelation of okay i gotta like do son of that previous book and make explicit when you put all these pieces together there is no room for free will whatsoever we are nothing more or less than the biology which brought us to this moment over which we had no control and its interactions with environment that brought us to this moment which over which we had no control so the first half of the book is like trying to in a less screechy way, like convince somebody of that and basically go after all of the contemporary compatibilist arguments where you don't have to deal with like a medieval peasant. You can deal with someone contemporary who says, yeah, atoms exist and molecules exist and neurons are for real. But here is somehow how you still pull free will out of the, the rabbit's hat there of like taking on the contemporary arguments for free will. Um, the second half of the book is the one that's been much more challenging to me since I was 13, which is, okay, okay, you convinced me there's no free will, I give up, okay. Um, oh my God, what if people actually started believing this? How are we supposed to function? What's the world supposed to look like? if we all accepted that there's no free will at all and what the second half of the book is about is like trying to wrestle with that and the themes over and over in there are number one the roof isn't going to cave in we're not going to have like murderers running throughout the streets because over and over we've been able to deal with subtracting responsibility out of our understanding of where behavior comes from. And not only doesn't the world run amok at that point, it's become a more humane place. Wow, witches really don't cause hailstorms. So that is one point. Another is this sort of knee-jerk response of, oh my God, if it's a deterministic world and there's no free will, does that mean nothing can change? No, it means this is exactly how we change. Here's the biology of how you turn Nazis into ex-Nazis 40 years later who were remorseful, all of that. And I guess the third final theme in there um, is if you look at this and this is depressing as hell, as hell, oh my God, maybe my like corner 
office and my corporation and my sense of like self-esteem that I've gotten from that wasn't earned because there's no free will or whatever. What a bummer. Maybe this leaves a big existential void. If that's your response to there being no free will, you're one of the lucky ones. From most humans on Earth, their experience isn't being given credit for stuff that they really aren't worthy, worthy of being credited for. For most humans, it's being blamed for stuff that was out of your control. And a world in which people stop believing in free will is going to be a hell of a lot more humane. I have a lot of questions, Robert. <laughs> um, I sent a note around to my inner circle uh, about a week ago in anticipation and preparation for this interview. And the response on this topic was very polarizing. There were some people who thought uh, there were three responses in three groups. One group was like, it doesn't matter. A book is, we've been having this discussion of free will for centuries, uh, a book isn't going to change that. There was another camp that said this is horribly dangerous because it could lead to nihilism at a time when we need a pro-social response from more people. Um, and then another camp, which was actually the majority, including my girlfriend, <laughs> they felt liberated by it because it, it got them off the hook of things that had been bothering them and they're content in their own lives. Um, so it, it made them, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm doing. So it was really fascinating three, three categories, uh, of response. And these are largely intellectual, well, well-read, uh, people that I shared it with. But, um, before I ask you further questions, could you just define what you mean by free will? Is it a binary thing? Yes or no? Or is it a, a spectrum or a continuum? Yeah. And this this part of the debate itself, um, and apropos of that, and you're, you're canvassing people, it's interesting that you didn't get, in fact, the most common response, including people who think about this a lot, including people who like make a profession thinking about this a lot, saying, yeah, 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 this is how the brain works. This is how genes work. This is how poor, but somehow I still believe in free will and it's still there, which is very different from your people who said, oh my God, nihilism, the people who say, well, even if there isn't free will, we probably shouldn't tell people that because things mm. are going to go crazy after that. Most people somehow are, the term is compatibilists. They're able to believe in things like 21st century technology and science and stuff, but somehow there's still a way of getting free will out of there. And that's 90 to 95% of contemporary philosophers. So, so it's almost like a, it's almost like a religion then like, uh, I'm not going to die. Climate change isn't going to be a disaster because the truth is so painful that you don't, it's like cognitive dissonance of sorts. Yeah. And of course the most interesting ones are these super smart philosophers who go on and on in books that I can't understand about how, yes, 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 I'm willing to admit, I believe this is a physical universe, but here's where we get free will from. And when you really, really look at what they're saying, and when you look at their like YouTube lectures and you look at where their faces get sort of wincy and pained looking and stuff, most of the time what they're saying is, please, let's pretend there's free will because damn, this is going to be scary if there isn't, um, which puts you, you know, one of those circles of your friends. Okay. So what do I mean by free will? Um, people who get gummed up with free will stuff in the legal realm, it's always stuff like, did you know you had options to behave differently? Were you aware of what the consequences would be of the option you did choose? All that, That's all the stuff about intent. Um, and that's completely boring to me. Um, then there's a whole school of people, neurobiologists, who think about free will. And what they say is something that's sort of like the, the cousin of like the legal approach, which is when you first become aware that you intend to do something, is it possible to show that your brain already decided to do that? Is the awareness, is your sense of intent just a total red herring? 
And in fact, your brain decided before you think you're decided, whoa, there's no free will. And this was from some landmark experiments in the 1980s. And people have been fighting about the interpretation of that ever since. And, you know, it's not clear. Because, and it totally bores me also. Because both the legal realm and the ooh, when do you become aware of intent? And is that different from when you become aware of being aware of intent? And here we're going to fight that for the next 10 years between the neuroscientists and the philosophers. None of those people and none of the legal people ask, where did that intent come from in the first place? And that's where things fall apart because the intent came from what those neurons were doing a second ago and what the hormones were doing this morning and what your fetal life and genes and culture and all of that. And when you look closely at that, there isn't a crack in that edifice of biology interacting environment from what your ancestors were up to to what happened a millisecond ago. There isn't a crack in there in which you can shoehorn in this non-biological notion that... There's free will. So one of my coaches uh, has been um, talking to me about meditation and, and other things and shares this qu famous quote from Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. Uh, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I've always loved this quote. But in light of your recent book, what, what are your thoughts on that quote? Um, it's beautiful. Um, it's clearly what was needed to sustain people who survived concentration camps, and Viktor Frankl was one of them. Um, but he understood the reality of it. People who became depressed and gave up in concentration camps died. People who were able to, quote, choose to hold on to what mattered to them and you know their sense of self-worth and whatever and had these amazing abilities to resist during this hellhole um they only survived if they had all those admirable traits plus a hell of a lot of luck because if you didn't have that luck if your number came up today it didn't matter how you know optimistic your basic temperament was so he was taking basically the lesson that got him through that and it's incredibly powerful nonetheless that's not how the biology of it works you look at somebody in a concentration camp who sunk into depression and they were dead two months later even before starvation was enough to explain it and you look at someone like victor frankel who was able to find meaning in life which plus a hell of a lot of luck, got him out the other end. And it's not by chance that those two people differed. But but maybe maybe it's the belief in free will in this case was more important than actual free will. Absolutely. Um, on the other hand, if you believe you were responsible for the fact that you haven't become rich um, just because you happen to have been born poor, that's not a very good recipe for coming out the other end, feeling good about yourself. Okay, here's a great example of this. Like one of the stupidest ways in which we could think about, ooh, biology affects our perceptions of us. Like the shape of your skull, the shape of your skull, how symmetrical it is, whether the zygomatic arches underneath your eyes that make your cheekbones are of a particular shape. Or, you know, yeah, it's got nothing to do with free will. It's got to do, we know, bone morphogenic, morphogenic proteins and all of that. And it just so happens that in one realm, if you luck out and you have one of these nice symmetrical faces that counts as more attractive, people like you more. They treat you better. They unconsciously are more cooperative with you. They're more likely to vote for you. So you get somebody who like is sitting in the corner office and part of it is that they've got magnificent cheekbones and whoa there's no free will maybe you shouldn't feel quite so proud of all your accomplishments because your cheekbones are just the first of the zillion things that you didn't control
But then in another setting, if you're sitting in a defendant seat in a courtroom and you happen to have those cheekbones that are not of the beautiful type, you're more likely to get convicted. The attractiveness of a defendant influences for the same exact circumstances with mock juries and experiments, the likelihood of getting convicted. People who are more attractive, African-American men who have less, less Afro-stereotypical features to their face are less likely to get convicted. That's not stop feeling so good about yourself, about your corner office. That's you were more likely to get sent to jail because of this like dumbass business about the symmetry of your skull. What kind of world is this? What does uh, 18 to 20 year old uh, listening to this podcast who does not have a symmetrical face to make <laughs> of what you just said? It sucks. <laughs> it sucks because this is a very deeply ingrained, uh, you know, primates and other animals like more attractive organisms, fruit flies, like more symmetrical ones. And symmetrical here is just like the tip of the iceberg of all the versions of good biological luck. It sucks. Amid that, the notion that there is an average, that there is a norm out there, this is what a normal person is supposed to look like. This is a normal height. This is a normal degree of extroversion. This is a normal degree of beauty. This is a normal. Normal is an emergent artifact. There is no normal. There is no human who is normal. And normal is an artifact that every one of those traits, just to get all like chaos theory stuff, is a strange attractor. Nobody is normal. What we call normal is people whose collections of traits are statistically closest to what we've decided counts as desirable and healthy. There's no normal out there that you're failing to live up to. Is, is there uh, something interesting on, on the other side of this that someone listening to this or even myself, um, when I hear you don't have free will, I'm like, hell yeah i do i'm going to show you and and it actually becomes a, a flipping moment where they it, it may not actually be free will but it may become dedication or motivation that was nascent within them towards some life of purpose or something different that was triggered by someone telling them they didn't have free will what do you think about that yeah, here's here's a scenario I've experienced like I can almost see it coming and I'm like not trying to sound snarky here but like it's kind of like this I'm sitting there I have office hours two students are there taking my class and they're saying oh, I don't know about this free will stuff and but you know what about I feel like I'm having free will and and I'm saying there's no free will and here's the biological explanation for what you just brought up and at an incredibly high rate over my like 40 years of doing this at some point one of the students is going to lean forward pick up a pen and say i just decided to pick up that pen are you telling me i had no free will on this and over these years asking the question which of those two students are going to do that and i will bet you i have about 85 90 percent predictability if i know one of them is male, one of them is female. I'm betting it's more likely to be the male. One of them is male who is heterosexual and the female is attractive. I'm betting it's more likely to be the male. One of them is first generation from an immigrant group that came here as refugees. They're less likely to challenge me. One of them hates their father and I keep reminding them of that. They're more likely to challenge me. One of them had higher testosterone levels this morning. They're the one who's more likely to challenge. One of them has more self-esteem problems and the one time they stood up to a bull in middle school they got a sense of self-esteem from that they're more likely give me all tell me how their frontal cortex is wired tell me what their fetal life was like tell me what culture tell me if they're 
fourth generation going to my like elite school, or if they got in as a first generation, fourth generation, they're much more likely to want to take on some like dead white male sitting there. Uh, first generation, they're more likely to feel grateful or intimidated about challenging open, like throw all those variables together. And I got like 90% predictability with that. And that's because where did that intent to pick up that pen just come from? Where did that intent in the other person to not pick up the pen where it came from? It came from one second before and a decade before and a thousand years before and all of that. Wow. Um, I was about to tell you uh, something that happened to me this morning, but but then you're going to psychoanalyze me. But um <laughs> On the days of a podcast, I go for a long bike ride because it oxygenates me. And I came back and I was craving like protein, um, an omelet with cheese. And I was opening the fridge and I just, uh, it wasn't like I'm going to show Robert. It was unbidden <laughs> to me. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to have an omelet. I'm going to have an oatmeal. So I didn't want oatmeal, but I just to prove to myself, it's a tiny little trivial example, but is, is that free will that in the moment I changed what I wanted to do, uh, but kind of because I wanted to prove you wrong a little bit or what's going on there? No, of course not. There was no free will there at all. Like if you, okay, as a, as a, you know, canonical example, if you grow up thinking your parents are the greatest and as an adult, you wind up exactly like them, you didn't choose to be that way. If you grow up and circumstances has caused you to hate and despise your parents, and as an adult, you make sure you do exactly the opposite of them in every single possible domain, you're just as determined. You're just as, there's no more free will in that case than the other. Or if you've decided you love some of these attributes of them and hate others, so you're a hybrid of them. Okay, so you, this morning, after the bike ride, looking in there, um, so first thing, uh, where'd your self-reflection come from? You didn't choose to be someone capable of like emotionally intelligent self-reflection and examination of your motives and behaviors. Next, where did your sense of like, to the extent that I represent any sort of like neurobiological authority, where did your sense of like occasionally challenging their bullshit you're, you're, you're higher from. up on the baboon hierarchy than than me uh well in in talking about how neurons work i definitely am in navigating the social world my guess is i'm definitely not but <laughs> where did where did you become the sort of person who would want to say some version of i'm going to show them um where did you become somebody who would have critical thinking and enough respect for critical thinking to think critically and say, this maybe constitutes a refutation of this stance where that didn't come from nowhere. If you had grown up marinating an alcohol from your mom when you were a fetus, you wouldn't have been capable of that critical self-reflection. If you had grown up in a culture where they said what you were told is true and do not challenge authority, or if you were thrown, grown up in a culture where your like ethos is anything the man says is bullshit and you should challenge it, you didn't choose which of those cultures. You didn't, And every one of those steps along the way, nor... Did you choose the neurochemical makeup of the part of your brain that does starch craving versus protein craving? And depending on how those two places were wired through no credit to you, it would have something to do with how readily you could think about this intellectual thought experiment of taking on this stance that there's no free will and showing that it's not really the case here by foregoing starch instead of protein maybe in some other case you're the reinforcement you would get from one of those was so powerful that you would do the i'm going to show him in some other setting you're going to wait for the next elevator instead of cramming in there you see i chose to do that because you happen to have a brain that's wired for really really liking like starch after a bike ride so that's not where you would have done that experiment Every one of those steps, none of that was free. So actually that brings up another kind of profound, uh, insight while you were speaking. And I don't, I don't want 
to make all these examples about me, but when we're talking about free will, I, I only know my own, my own brain. So, you know, I worked on wall street, I was a teacher and then all of a sudden I've got this podcast and it's becoming more popular. I'm getting emails from around the world. I'm getting traction with people in government, with universities, and it feels like my life is no longer my own and, and listening to you speaking it makes me even more have a fiduciary responsibility <laughs> to these times and to help midwife society through to a softer landing than the default. And you talking about that we don't free have free will actually makes me feel more of, of that drive and, and that, um, you know, acting as a, a golden retriever, Overton window sort of a vector in these conversations. What, what's going on there as I'm feeling that? Well, once again, you're proving there's no free will because lots of other people at your juncture would decide it's hopeless. And instead, you take this information and you've turned it into some sort of moral imperative to try to like make the world whole. Um, that doesn't happen by chance. That's not random. Who's capable of doing that? Lots of people who find out about this, like collapse into like self-interest or nihilistic nothingness. Or Where did that response come from? That's an incredibly healthy response, especially for all the people in the world around you. That's a great way. As And that didn't come from out of nowhere. Nothing comes from nothing. But like your dad had 14% of the architects had learned from him, cultural evolution can happen that way, irrespective of whether there is free will or not. Of course, but whether culture evolves isn't dependent on whether or not there's free will. Um, I don't think there is free will, uh, cultural phenomenon could be explained with the same biology interacting with environment, blah, 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 that I've been spouting. Um, cultural evolution could be explained by the myth of free will as well. It's, it's in some ways a separate topic until you start getting into what were the nuts and bolts about how the culture just evolved. So what about free won't? Uh, so about 10 years ago, um, I, like you love dogs and I realized that pigs were smarter than dogs or as smart. And I, one of my favorite things to eat was bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. <laughs> and my girlfriend didn't eat meat. And I'm like, I'm giving up pork, but it was very difficult. So I created this image in my head of trucks uh, on the highway that had pigs in them, but instead they were dogs. And I had this visceral negative response to any menu with, uh, with pork on it. And I haven't had pork in, in 10 years. So that's not free will. Um, but I call it free won't. I decided something that was ethically important to me. And I, I created a way for my neocortex to, to trump my limbic system in the moment. How, how do you explain that? It's a little bit of a semantic issue as to what counts as free will versus free won't. Your experience can be an example of free won't, I'm not going to eat pig anymore. Or it could be an example of free will, I'm going to stick to a moral stance of mine. So it's a little bit semantic. And insofar as it's semantic, it's the same answer. Where'd that free won't come from in you? First off, where did your knowledge of like what gets done to pigs? Where did your love of dogs come from? Where did your capacity to generalize empathy from dogs to pigs? Where did your knowledge of pig intelligence come from? Where did your frontal cortex get the means for you to like look at uh, the bacon lettuce tomato sandwich on the menu and somehow to suppress the associated cravings and instead pull up an image of terrified dogs in a transport truck or your your mother did something right by you that you have a frontal cortex that was capable capable of regulating impulsive cravings to that extent because that got constructed at you at some point your brain is of a type where whatever rewards bacon 
gives to your the correct neurons in there. It's not so powerful that it overwhelms your capacity for, you know, emotional regulation. And it's quite possible that you have lurking in there a craving for something else that you wouldn't be able to override. You have, for sure. and not because you lack self-confidence, self-discipline there, but because, oh, you're wiring, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream sets off neurons that will not be said no to. Um, but bacon didn't once you set your conscious frontal cortex to it sufficiently. So if there is free will, um, would it reside in the frontal cortex? Um, well, Again, not to sound snarky, but that's a hard one for me to answer because that's, in a sense, asking me if if the tooth fairy existed, okay. which, let which me, neurons would let, let me she rephrase be making the use question. Of? Let me rephrase yeah. the question. So, uh, in the Amazon uh, bio for Determined, uh, they write that Sapolsky mounts a full frontal assault on the pleasant fantasy that there is some separate self telling our biology what to do, but couldn't biology itself in our ancestral environment created via evolution and adaptation, such a separate self from novel historical circumstances that, that is the part of a body that exerts control, um, in certain situations in my situation to decide not to eat pork. Well, Yes and no. Um, this this puts us into sort of your area of like thinking about emergence. This is totally cool phenomenon. One of the like most interesting things about neuroscience is you take a neuron from a fruit fly and you take a neuron from us and they're the same thing. They're the same cell. They use the new, same neurotransmitters, the same wiring. We did not become human because we invented new parts of the brain or new types of neurotransmitters. What happened instead is one of those more is different scenarios of we've got a hundred million neurons for every neuron that a fly has, and you put that many of them together, and unexpected, complicated, adaptive, totally beautiful stuff emerges. And the interesting stuff in our brains are emergent phenomenon, like you give a chimp as many neurons as us, and it would come up with theology. It would come up with a totally different theology, and it would come up with aesthetics. It would come up with, okay, so why isn't free will just an emergent phenomenon? Mm. The belief in free will, the invention of the notion, the emotional connectedness to it and dependence upon the notion— is certainly emergent, but free will is not because neurons don't work that way. Okay, what do I mean by that? The coolest thing about emergence is you take an ant and it's making no sense at all, and you put 10 ants and they're just doing random incoherent stuff, and you put 10,000 of them and they build a whole society. And it's not because when you get 10,000 of them, suddenly the ants understand geometry or something. They know exactly the same simple, stupid, few local neighbor interaction rules that they did when there was just three of them. But when you put enough of them together, out pops this. And all of the models for how free will can be an emergent property requires you to break that rule and instead allow that once you get enough ants together, all of the ants can speak French. And once you get neurons together, all of them could work in ways that the physical universe doesn't allow. The whole, the coolest thing about like emergence is you look at our brains inventing stuff and we're made out of the same cells as Drosophila brains are. And they're still doing the same stupid things. The amazingness is what is like totally provincial three or four local neighbor rules. And suddenly you throw them enough of them together and 
they're still just as simple. That's that's the thing that makes me like almost want to weep at how cool emergence is, and it explains so many things out there. But any model in which you have to speculate that the emergent meta level property now suddenly gets the ability to reach down to the micro level of the constituent parts and make them work differently in much cooler ways. It can't work that way. And every version of free will coming out of an emergence requires that. So my work, uh, and you, you watched my movie recently, looks at the emergent constraints of the macro human economy, the 8 billion ants, 8 billion humans, that no one is con in control and that society, at least for now, is this uh, functioning as an energy hungry super organism. Um, but your recent work suggests the same is happening at the micro level in an individual brain of sorts. So am I correct in saying that biology constrains both our micro and our macro systems, uh, but it doesn't determine it. What, what do you think about that? Well, of course I'm going to disagree. Um, cause I don't think it just constrains when you look at all of the biological influences from a second ago to a million years ago, and you look at all the ways the biology interacts with environment, not only isn't it constraining or facilitating, that's all there is. That is what's there. That is who we are. That is how we arrived at being who we are at this moment. There's nothing but that. But you bring up... In your bringing up the micro level stuff, one of the like inevitable things that people get pulled to at this point, which is, oh, a deterministic universe and deterministic interactions of deterministic biology and interactive ways with deterministic environment, blah, 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 et cetera. What about quantum indeterminacy? And what's that? Because you th that's you get down at a sufficiently micro subatomic level and events right now were not caused by the events that just came before that. There is complete unpredictable randomness about how subatomic particles work. And people still like are boggled by it and don't fully understand it. And there's still like a, a counter-revolutionary old guard of physicists who say there's got to be actually a deterministic thing lurking in there someplace. But on a very, very subatomic level, um, things appear not to be deterministic and are totally random. And thus, what do you know? There's a whole school of philosophers who say free will comes out of quantum indeterminism. And that doesn't make any sense either. So let me go down a, a little bit of an academic rabbit hole uh, here. My PhD uh, uh, advisor, who's since passed away, Charles Goodnight, was an evolutionary biologist who focused on multi-level selection. The fact that it wasn't just um, selfishness, but it was the uh, individual competitiveness with group behavior, with maybe some bacteria or things in your gut that, that our selection was, uh, happened at multiple different levels. And he called that contextual analysis. So with respect to free will, doesn't it depend on multiple scales and dimensions like, um, uh, w what's happened, uh, to an organism's life. We say organisms have will, which might also, uh, describe as desire or preference. So an organism feels hunger. Okay. So it seeks food, finds it, eats, is satisfied. Then other drivers come kick in after it's satisfied. It has a uh, defense or shelter or to go to the bathroom or to mate. Um, so these are all genetic programs with chemical rewards but what about this case? The organism feels hunger, but because of the complexity of its emotions, its life, the society, um, it considers whether or not to act on that feeling. And especially if it's a human organism, such a complex animal with hundreds of millions of neurons, it might weigh or defer or change the paths because of these other contexts in its life. So how does context fit in with free will, especially with human animals? Um, it's beautiful. 
it's incredibly important and i've i have such respect for multi-level selection people just because they were like out crying in the wilderness for such a long time people like david sloan wilson and he's been on my podcast yeah ah uh, okay he's great and he was like a pariah for yeah. like until uh not in an active kin selection but david sloan wilson and eo wilson decided that they actually agreed on more things than they disagreed about and it was just like totally beautiful and the resolution was context in some settings, this is the most appropriate level of analysis at the level of groups. In some settings, it's, you know, genomic non-expressed DNA, and you're looking at selfish DNA. At sometimes it's the whole genome, and sometimes, and yeah, it's context dependent. And context is like the most interesting thing about us because like this was my my last book was all about this uh you know the biology of our best behaviors and our worst behaviors what's most interesting about it is you could have the exact same behavior the same neurons telling the same muscles do the same exact thing and depending on the context you could just be ethnically cleansing a village or you could be mother teresa in one setting pulling a trigger is like self-sacrificial and amazing and in another it's like one of the most heartless things to do like the motoric aspects of the behavior we carry out yeah that's kind of interesting to learn the biology of that that's nowhere near as interesting as what it means in that context and that's exactly what all of this is about so your dog just shook uh his head <laughs> and i heard the chain and the chain reminded me that you have a golden retriever in your office and that made me happy and it made me more positive and maybe that changed the framing of my next question so that's also context or is that totally Absolutely. unrelated to free will okay so that's context that that's that's one of the sets of webs which went all wound together and in that case context was about five minutes long knowing i had a golden but also 30 years long since you were growing up with goldens and 40,000 years long since you were of a culture that like likes dogs instead of eating them, all of that. But yeah, that's exactly where that came from. So how do you define Robert, the difference between free will and agency? Do you feel any sort of agency in your life? And how do you still feel, um, a drive to contribute to good in the world if you don't see us as, as having free will? Well, this is where like, there's no such thing as free will. There's no such thing as agency, a criminal justice system that uses the notion of responsibility and blame and punish punishment makes no sense whatsoever. At the same time, a meritocracy that runs on notions of praise and reward makes just as little sense. None of it makes any sense. And someone like telling you, you did something rotten. Ultimately, if you really, really believe it makes as little sense as saying that earthquake did something rotten and someone telling you, you just did something great and what a good job makes as little sense as telling a flower. That's a great like odor that do you release a fragrance or whatever like that's the reality how in hell do you function that way how do i function that way i function that way about one tenth of one percent of the time where i truly truly am able to think i don't deserve anything i am not entitled to anything i have earned nothing where i truly can think hating somebody makes as little sense as hating an earthquake yeah i could pull that off for about three and a half seconds at a time before i fall into my lifetime of cultural training um or framed a different way one tenth of one percent of the time I can actually function in a way that I think is the only morally acceptable way for us to function. In other words, it's not easy and like we all got a long way to go with it, but at least start trying to think that way in the domains that really matter uh, when you're deciding like 
who gets a life sentence without parole, or when you're deciding who gets a corporate salary that's a hundred times higher than the people working in the warehouse. And like, if you don't want to have to try to figure out why that explains why you like, uh, you know, bacon constitutively more than you like Ben and Jerry's, that's fine. You know, leave the science alone for that. Just go with your instincts that there's agency there. But when it comes to the big stuff, if we can only pull it off some of the time, that's where we have the moral obligation to do that. So, so what are the societal, impl I mean, you've spent years presumably uh, writing this book and you said that you've been since you were 13 you believe this way so you've obviously thought about the implications of this could we use the the scientific uh foundations that you outline and determined uh to influence the behavior or the policies the institutions of our world in a positive way well i guess at this point Am I going to sound like an NPR tote bag toting liberal? Or am I going to sound like someone who's much more left in my extreme? Or am I going to sound someone who's so far out, like I'm not even in the same playing field in terms of lunatic fringe? The only, it puts you at the lunatic fringe. Somebody tells you nice cheekbones. And that makes as little sense to feel good afterward as somebody telling you have a good moral philosophy and you have just used that to make a million lives better and thank you for being that person. That makes as little, none of it makes any sense if you really, really follow this stuff out and the cheekbone end it doesn't really matter, but getting people to think more correctly about punishment and reward and who deserves anything um, and whether hate ever makes sense at all, that's where it has some major societal consequences. I mean, just, you know, as one example of that, we understand how epilepsy works to some degree. There was a time when people didn't. And if somebody had an epileptic seizure, what they did to you in their 15th century village was burn you at the stake because you were demonically possessed. Whoa, understanding how this stuff works has societal implications. That's thousands of people who were burned at the stake. Understanding that schizophrenia isn't caused by crappy, psychodynamically hostile mothering and instead a neurogenetic disorder whoa, that makes a big difference in how the world, world works. And in every one of these cases, it makes for a more humane world. It's like really good that we don't burn people with epilepsy at the stakes or tell mothers of teenagers who've just been diagnosed with schizophrenia, some Freudian bile that you caused it because unconsciously you hate your child. Like it's a better world at each one of these steps. So what, what is the difference between a deterministic, uh, world, which you are describing and a fatalistic or nihilistic, uh, mindset or worldview? Great. Um, the fatalistic one is the worst place you could arrive from all of this stuff, which is to look at all of these biological threads around our fingers and all of these environmental and all of these biology environment interaction threads and and collectively they're much more than threads they're a gigantic cocoon blah 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 to con to conclude nothing can change so why bother what you proved is something can change you don't eat bacon anymore um it's not really because you chose to no longer eat bacon. It's because you were cho you were changed previously in life in ways that made it possible for you to learn about pig intelligence and to evoke images of puppies and trucks. We don't change. We don't choose to change, but we sure are changed. And we have to make use of our knowledge about how that change comes about. Because if we don't think the change happens, we're totally screwed. Nihilism is not like a very happy picture for how we should go about looking at what else there is out there. So this is really a huge call to changing our cultural environment, but really to education. 
um, and many other things because humans can change, but only if our two seconds ago, one month ago, five years ago, 40 years ago, and we can't change the 40 years ago or the 400 years ago, but we can change our cultural stimuli, uh, at least in theory, right? So education and, and moving in the direction of some of these pro-social outcomes will be able to change other people and empower them to do the environmental equivalent of giving up pork or whatever it is. Absolutely. So you get somebody who, because of environmental events, learns that something crummy is going on in Ukraine and they say, wow, I'm going to educate myself about the history of like Slavic, you know, tribalism or whatever. And they come out the other end and tell people, you know, any of this Putin saying this is about NATO, this is about, this is nonsense. In the 19th century, the Russians were saying the Ukrainians couldn't use their own language. This is centuries old. What have you just done there? You have been exposed to environmental stimuli telling you that something's going on in Ukraine and you decide, I'm going to learn more about it. How do you turn into the sort of person who at that juncture would say, I'm even interested in the news. I want to learn more about it. I'm going to use my critical thinking to see maybe one of the stories being spouted here isn't actually all that accurate. Who taught you to challenge stuff like that? Who taught you to read? Who to blah, blah, all the ways in which you could have been a different person in no ways that you can control. And once that brought about a change in you, whoa, this has nothing to do with NATO. This has to do with different Slavic tribes hating each other for half a millennium. Then you're capable of telling that to somebody else. And perhaps they're in a position to be changed by that as a result. Like, on the most basic, like concrete, are you kidding me? You know, yeah, actually the world needs to work this way. Um, if you've been listening to this podcast and you've decided this is incredibly galvanizing to you, or if you've decided this is totally wrong, or if you've decided this is boring, or if you've decided you really want to get like a cookie, um, your brain is structurally different than it was two seconds ago because it has to be. That's how it works. If what you've concluded is, this is boring, I'm going to get a cookie, your brain has probably changed in a way that's not going to have a whole lot of long-term consequences. But somewhere in there, there are three and a half synapses that are now working differently than they were working 10 minutes ago. They may no longer be working differently 10 minutes from now. It's a very transient effect. Or if this decides, makes you decide you're going to go out and become like a Baptist preacher or something, that change persisted. But everything, something just changed in your brain in a way that is ultimately only explainable by the physical universe. And thus, like you go get a cookie or thus you go devote the rest of your life to a different cause than you would have 10 minutes ago because that's all there is. There's nothing more than that. And anything more you would invoke to explain that, you're invoking magic that defies how the physical universe works and how emergent systems work and whether or not quantum indeterminacy has anything to do with what you order on the menu. It's simply doesn't work that way. Why did you write this book? It wasn't free will. You had to have a, an idea in your mind. Other than getting the science right, you've been a lifelong scholar of the human and, and primate brain. But what was your hope in, in writing this book? Um, well, everything ranging from to make this a more humane, humane world to showing those asshole bullies when I was 14 year old in junior high and they were bullying me, look what I've done, to making money, to having people think I'm a kind person, to having people think I have nice cheekbones because they're confusing writing a good book with all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with it and are not based in reality. Yeah, you know, all this stuff because my parents wanted me to 
be a doctor. And they went to their graves wanting me to be a doctor. And I turned it to this instead. Yeah, look at this. Look at, you see? <laughs> you see? Because they wanted me to be a critical thinker. Yeah, look at this. You see? So it, it had to come out. This book had, it was like you had to give birth to this book as a natural uh, continuum of your life's work. Yeah, but in the exact same way, but in a much less interesting level, that I forgot to bring the charger with me <laughs> when I went from outside back to here. So are, I mean, I, I love all of your books. I've read about a third of this one because it's 500 pages and dense <laughs> and I've been really busy. Um, but I can see uh, this book ha striking a nerve, especially with what's going on in our social discourse today. Are you worried at all about the academic public uh, response to this book? It, could there be a similar drama uh, like there was created by uh, Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene in the 70s, which was a naive interpretation uh, of, <laughs> of, of selfishness back then, but could there be a naive interpretation of the science uh, that could rationalize apathy and nihilism? Are you, are you mm -hmm. excited about that? Do you have some trepidation? Uh, what are you, what can you share? Um, and by the way, characterizing that as naive with Dawkins is exactly one would get from a card carrying multi-level selectionist. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty damn naive and, uh, and dogmatic, but but it, but it did become popular and it was grabbed by people to rationalize, look, humans are naturally this way, which was an incorrect interpretation. But do, are you worried that we might get the same reaction with your book? I don't have any free will. That's what made me do it. I, it wasn't my fault. Um, absolutely. And some of that's exciting and some of that's terrifying because I'm just like this twerpy professor sitting someplace and if somebody decides um like maligning their religious beliefs or at the other end of the spectrum if i'm maligning their social identity and their validation of it or, and they're gonna hate me that's gonna suck um i i have a bit of a conundrum in that intellectually I'm very, very combative and love it. And interpersonally, I am totally meek and skittish. So there's going to be an interesting, interesting balancing of those tendencies, depending on how much somebody hates my ideas versus if they wind up hating me. I, I get it. So intellectually, Robert, how could you be wrong about this? Is there an experiment or something that you could discover that would change your mind that humans have free will? Absolutely. Um, and conveniently, it's an impossible experiment, but what the hell? Um, okay, you've just done something with like incredible consequence. You've pulled a trigger as highly context dependent, like this matters. It makes a difference. And it's possible to track down like the one little node of neurons that told your muscle to do that. So let's look at that node of neurons. If you could show me, they would have done the exact same thing, regardless of what any of the neighboring neurons did in the previous seconds. That's kind of interesting and impressive. But then show me that they would have done the exact same thing regardless of what you had for breakfast, whether you were tired, scared, stressed, aroused, whatever. And then show me it would have done the same thing no matter what your hormone levels were. And show me they would have done the exact same thing whether you grew up in an individualist or a collectivist culture. And show me that if you changed every gene inside those neurons into the set of genes that the person sitting next to you had, do all of those things. And if those neurons still made you do the exact same thing, you've just proven free will. <laughs> Go. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Um, 
Okay. I, 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 as I said, I have hours of questions for you. Um, but I want to be respectful of your time. I have one more question re related to your book, uh, and your work, and then, and then we'll get to the, the closing questions that I ask all my guests. So, so what might be some, some key components or even key questions, uh, in a new systems informed design of society based on an understanding of neuroscience, physiology, and, and no free will. Um, writ small, a huge challenge for the field is we know a lot about how like a neuron works or a little, a little circuit of neurons. And we know about like the kind of stuff that brains produce like ideology or or love or things like that. It's really tough. The scaling up problem, the intermediate range is the big challenge. Um, because traditionally you could look at the electrical activity of three neurons at a time. Now, these days you can canvas activity in 10,000 neurons and look at their gene expression profiles. And you get these massive bioinformatic data sets and nobody is smart enough to be able to think in 11 dimensions at once. So the connecting the two levels. Okay. So that's uh, let's see, I hope lots of grad students are able to do that in the centuries to come. Um, the much bigger to do is how do we get past the sense that uh, judgment makes sense and punishment makes sense and praise makes sense and that somebody really isn't responsible for the most wondrous things you can imagine or the most damaging. And how do you get past that fact that in the right circumstances, it feels really good to punish someone for righteous reasons. How are we going to do this? But, you know, three, 400 years ago, people managed to do that in thinking about the biologically deterministic phenomenon of epilepsy and subtract Satan out of it. And we've done it over and over again in all sorts of other realms. This kid is having trouble reading because of a biologically deterministic thing called dyslexia, not because they're lazy. We've done it. We've done it over and over. We got to do it over and over again. I sometimes feel that we're in this like twilight zone movie. And often in my lectures, I say that we've arrived at a species level conversation that we're the first generation of homo sapiens to, to be able to not, not necessarily that we are, but we have the ability to figure out where we came from, how we got here, what we're doing to each other, to the planet, what our biology is, uh, what we actually need, what our natural resource balance sheet is, or that of the earth. And it, it feels like your story is a, is a piece of this. It's like looking in the mirror at Homo sapiens and looking all around us. And are we going to have enough time to integrate this stuff? Do you get that feeling or how, how do you respond to what I just said? Absolutely. Uh, as, as a way of kind of summarizing everything you preach about, uh, the clock's ticking and we got a lot of stuff to overcome and a lot of it taps into this sort of framed from my view of the world. What is the universe of circumstance that has made us into a species that's insatiable? Why was something wonderful yesterday not enough tomorrow? Um, why are there a few exceptions to that? Why are there some people who didn't turn out that way? How can we you know, opportunize knowledge about that to get to save the world in time. Um, whereas your level of solving the same problem is, uh, hey, you know, oil reserves are not going to last forever. This is an anomaly. You know, there's all these different levels of attacking the same problem. Uh, the clock is ticking. We're running out of all sorts of important stuff. And it's very much in our nature to be awful to have nots when times get bad and like go for it there's no shortage of approaches that are desperately needed to try to fix some of this stuff
what what would you like the viewers and listeners of this podcast to take away from this brief overview a um, little bit of your earlier work but primarily your new book determined um a science uh, of life without free will well how how, sh how would you like people to to take this subject on after hearing this this isn't scary because, oh my God, science, I hated ninth grade biology. This isn't scary because the concepts are like inaccessible. This isn't scary because it means there's no purpose in life, anything but that. This isn't scary because it means we're all going to run amok. The world's going to become more humane. Um, and this isn't scary because if you're one of the lucky ones, it's going to make you feel like you don't deserve all the great things you've gotten. You don't deserve the great things you've gotten. But for most people on earth, what they're going to find out is they don't deserve to have not gotten most of the great things they were deprived. So this is a wonderful thing. So this is not, oh my God, this is like, the roof isn't going to cave in. It's going to be better afterward, inter-individually and on a societal level. Um, if we understand like where we're coming from and where we're coming from is it doesn't make sense to feel like you are entitled to be treated better than another human. And it doesn't make sense to think that there's something like evil in looking at the damaging things that this collection of atoms we call humans are doing versus damaging things that other collections of atoms are doing. Like this can only be good things. And again, I could manage to think this way like 1% of the time. So nobody's saying this is going to be easy, but like we got to try.